But I want to move to an, an example of scholarship as conversation that illustrates this, this idea of a sort of a decades-long evolution of scholarly conversation. And so for here, we'll use uh, feminism as an, as an example. So with feminism, the chronology of fem feminism is much debated and um, argued about, and it's broken down into what are called waves. And so we're going to go through the first three waves of feminism and talk about how this illustrates this, this idea of scholarship as conversation. This um, newspaper cover is from 1910. It's a famous uh, newspaper cover uh, from England when a bunch of suffragists uh, rallied at Westminster to try to get the vote. And they were beaten up by police and actually by men who had just come uh, on their own just to oppose uh, the suffragettes. So the first wave of feminism is the concern for suffrage or the the primary goal of of this was constitutional rights so the right to vote the right to own, own property and what's important to understand about the first wave of feminism is that a lot of the women who were suffragettes would not have identified as feminists okay and so Impo we're imposing feminism onto the, the sort of suffragettes as we impose a chronology uh, to understand the evolution of feminism, first wave, second wave, third wave. Um, but the, the primary concern of the suffragettes was about the, the right to vote and the uh, right to own property. Um, I'll use a, an example some of you might identify with. There's Red Dead Redemption 2. And you may have met the uh, uh, suffragettes in Red Dead Redemption too. So they're first wave feminism. But we get to the uh, end post World War II, and we have what's called the second wave uh, feminism. And again, with with some of these, there's arguments about when the waves start and stop. So that's also part of the, the conversation is how you, you date uh, the waves um, and when one ends and when one starts. But um, we're, we'll, we'll take second wave feminism as a starting with Simone de Beauvoir, the very uh, famous French existentialist uh, philosopher and uh, longtime partner with uh, Jean-Paul Sartre. Um, de Beauvoir wrote a very important book in 1949 called the second sex it appeared in french obviously first but it was translated into english very quickly and de beauvoir was less interested in the issues of like the right to vote uh although the french women just actually got it after world war ii and constitutional rights what de beauvoir's very interesting contribution to the conversation was to say that gender is a social construct and that radically changed the debate of, around feminism so you're not just debating about the right to own property the the, the right to vote you're now debating very profound uh, issues about cultural uh, norms and construction of motherhood and things like that and so that was extremely uh, important uh, from from de Beauvoir and to this day remains extremely uh, important to think about gender as a social construction. So the, the difference between sort of sex and gender in terms of uh, uh, this distinction. So de Beauvoir is absolutely uh, incredibly important for this. The other towering figure of second wave feminism is uh, the American Betty Friedan here and she wrote a, a really monumental book that came out in 1963 called The Feminine Mystique. Now this is a little bit after uh, 
de Beauvoir, and there's a lot of debate about how much de Beauvoir influenced uh, uh, Friedan. Uh, Friedan doesn't really talk too much about de Beauvoir, but Betty Friedan, she's a very interesting, uh, I mean, again, I'm, I'm not doing huge justice to any of these, whether it's theory of evolution or de Beauvoir for Dan here, but I'm trying to illustrate the sort of development of, of a scholarship as conversation or the development of a, a, a conversation. What for, for Dan had done is she had interviewed uh, classmates of hers from her uh, university days. And this was after graduation years later, she had interviewed uh, her classmates and she found out basically that they were all miserable. So this is in the 1950s and that she had interviewed them and, and they were all miserable. And so Friedan had a very interesting argument in the feminist mystique and it's about that, you know, equality is not enough. So the right to vote, the right to own property, that's not enough. Um, you can still have women who are absolutely miserable who sacrifice it. so in, in Friedan's case the women she's she's interviewing that they'd sacrifice they're all college educated they'd sacrifice careers and become stay-at-home wives uh, and so on and they were all very very miserable and so Friedan had a very um, important contribution you can kind of see how how Friedan and de Beauvoir are similar uh, but different but both have a very different relationship to uh, first wave feminism. Their concerns are very, very different. Uh, so this is, you know, for Dan's book is about the sort of the, the unfulfilled life of the women that she was interviewing, right? Uh, and then we get to third wave feminism. And again, people will argue sort of, where it starts, who's most responsible for third wave feminism. Uh, but for our purposes here, we'll, we'll use Anita Hill's testimony uh, in 1991. Uh, so Anita Hill uh, testified at the Supreme Court hearing for Clarence Thomas in 1991. And Clarence Thomas had been nominated to the Supreme Court and Anita Hill came out and basically said, this guy sexually harassed me. Um, a lot consistently. Um, so Anita Hill testified to the U.S. Senate uh, panel, which was all men. Uh, and despite her testimony, uh, she she was basically dismissed by a lot of the the male members. And then uh, Clarence Thomas, as we all know, was confirmed to the Supreme Court. So this. This is a watershed moment for uh, a, a lot of people in, in terms of thinking about feminism. And, and uh, one of the key things or key takeaways here was this concept of what's called intersectionality. So uh, this sort of shows the evolution. So if we think for third wave feminism, it's, it's uh, about intersectionality. And what that means is that there's gender, but there's also race and class. Okay, so race, class, and gender, and that someone's lived experience is affected by all three of these things, race, class, and gender. So a lot of people involved in studying and thinking and writing about uh, feminism, third wave feminism, in particular, you might look back at the Beauvoir and Friedan and say, these were actually extremely privileged people. Uh, so, for Dan, for example, went to Smith College, which is an extremely uh, exclusive uh, all women's college in the United States. Uh, de Beauvoir came from a very uh, uh, well off family background. And so their experience would be different from somebody who is black or who is from a different socioeconomic class uh, and is a woman. So the third wave feminism is about a lot of things in terms of intersectionality. Uh, and to go back just very briefly, you know, for Dan and the 1960s, they're talking about, you know, other kind of legal aspects about, you know, access to birth control and things like that. Um, 
in Ireland, for example, uh, there was the, you know, when, when a, a, a woman uh, in the civil service in Ireland was, you know, got married, she had to resign her job. Uh, so they're kind of still nibbling at, you know, kind of what they see as sort of legal inequalities, whereas third wave feminism is now saying it's, it's, that's, that's fine, but it's also, you know, there's also other stuff going on here in terms of race, class, and gender. And the other thing about uh, third wave feminism is by the 1990s, there was a, a belief that maybe the kind of struggles or battles of previous generations uh, was what's being minimized or, or forgotten. And then arguably now we're into fourth wave uh, feminism uh, around uh, social media, Me Too, and things like that. Okay, so that's a very quick whirlwind uh, tour to show how people who think about feminism and, and women's rights uh, have their own scholarship has evolved over the decades, right? So let's go to the practical or the kind of concrete examples uh, of scholarship as conversation. So we're going to look at, at two here. And the idea here is that we'll illustrate a, a couple examples of scholarship as conversation in academic writing. And then in another lecture, we'll actually look at some very specific strategies. They say, I say, um, the Swales uh, creating a research space. Uh, strategies for you as beginning researchers and writers. But uh, this is from the, the book Cyber Chiefs, Autonomy and Authority in Online Tribes. It's by Matthew O'Neill. And just want to flag a few things here to show how O'Neill is, is engaged in uh, conversation. Uh, so Max Weber classically defined authority as the recognition by others of a person's legitimate right to exercise power. The question this book addresses is, how does authority take into account the central value of the internet autonomy? And then uh, O'Neill talks about Michel Foucault. Foucault suggested the expertise is an, that expertise is an instrument of elite domination. In his view, the state used scientific experts to define individuals and groups as deviant or sick and to justify the discriminatory treatment. So actually what O'Neill is doing here is he's flagged who his influences are. So who who he's listened to if we take scholarship as a conversation. Uh, this is O'Neill kind of saying, this is who I've heard, this is who I've listened to. And then look at what happens next here. He says, but specialized knowledge has also been used for autonomous purposes. So this is a very interesting and important move as a writer and a researcher that you'll have to learn. So Michel Foucault said this, but I'm actually saying this. So you see, this is now an example of where O'Neill is actually entering into conversation. Now, the other place uh, that he flags is Bourdieu here. So Pierre Bourdieu once said that sociology was a science of domination. Bourdieu's critical approach provides invaluable tools for understanding the reproduction of privilege. But does this mean that only sociologists can understand the truth of power, in other words? So again, um, O'Neill is flagging who he's uh, in conversation with. And then finally, just very quickly at the bottom here, David Beetham's contention that two legitimizing principles are more emancipatory than others. Uh, the first is the principle of sovereignty, and the second is meritocratic principle. So again, he's, he's, O'Neill has flagged who, in this case, he agrees with, right? Uh, so this is from the introduction and pro tip. If you really kind of want a very clear example of where uh, somebody is, is in conversation with, look at the introduction of a lot of these books or, or academic books. Uh, okay, so here's a, the, a second example. Uh, Paul Bew, Ireland, The Politics of Enmity, 1789 to 2006. And I show this example because of well, most importantly, it, it has footnotes. So as a, a brief aside, we don't see footnotes much anymore in books. We still see them a bit in journal articles, but let's all fingers crossed that footnotes make a comeback in scholarly uh, publications and books. They're kind of falling out of fashion because they, you know, publishers think it makes the page look uh, 
too academic and so they the people are using endnotes but footnotes are really fantastic because it's a shorthand for who the author is in conversation with so you could actually do a trick when a book has footnotes or a journal article has footnotes and you can actually just ignore the text and just read the uh the footnotes and then you kind of get a sense of who what the person is working with uh who they're reading and who they're in conversation with uh but again in terms of some specific examples jj lee has argued that popular support for and against the treaty did reflect this uh, michael hopkins has further suggested um and so on the results of local studies are varied so peter hart's study of county cork uh, suggests this michael ferry's equally interesting study of sligo but uh, this so this is one page but it shows really great examples of how bu is entering into scholarly conversation with these authors who have preceded this book or you know his, his own work here and again we can again you can kind of see everything that he he's mentioning uh is here so yeah footnotes so to conclude we've looked at a few examples of scholarly conversation that some sort of metaphorical examples some kind of artificial in the case of plato uh, and the socratic method uh, and then in the case of feminism a, an example of sort of the evolution of 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 conversation uh over over a few decades now let's just conclude with a few thoughts about the challenges and obstacles to entering a scholarly conversation so there's a lot there's a lot so at the beginning i mentioned one of the biggest challenges is actually knowing what conversations are going on in your field so if you are taking uh anthropology or history or law or something like that you'll be learning about different topics and one of the challenges is learning what's the current state of the the field or the discipline what are the topics that the the, the people are currently researching and most interested in um, what are the questions that are uh, kind of driving the research agenda um, so like in physics there's inflation theory right now is, is all the rage um, uh, so the real obstacle is sort of figuring out what's actually going on in terms of the conversation and identifying the charting the sort of evolution and uh, chronology of that conversation in terms of the research and the writers but there's ob the obstacles as well and one of the crucial ones there is the sort of terminology and technical terms so even to enter into a conversation requires a language uh, proficiency so you know if we take a, a, a law as a discipline has a lot of technical terms and language that's essential and so before you can even begin the scholarly conversation you have to have proficiency with these uh these these technical uh terms and that would go for a lot of a lot of uh, disciplines so we'll look at in another lecture the sort of once you can kind of get the the the, the big picture and you can identify a conversation you can chart a conversation which is i hope you're able to 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 begin the process now we're going to look at another lecture on strategies for as writers and researchers on dipping in your 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 or as burke said into uh that scholarly conversation so we'll consider that soon thanks for watching